Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Okay.
Well, it's 6.30, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Ben Davis Christian Church here. Uh, my name is Gary Johnson. It's a privilege to come and share with you from God's Word uh, with regard to heaven. And we want to welcome not only people who are here on site, but for uh, all of those visiting and uh, studying with us online, welcome to BDCC. I want to begin with a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to us, and thank you that we have hope in this tired, weary world. We have hope that is anchored in you, and thank you for the promise in your word that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, will soar on wings like eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not be faint. And so on this night, in this moment, we open your word and we anchor our hope in the promises that we read that we know are intended for us give us understanding please holy spirit and allow us empower us to leave differently than when we arrived we ask in the name of christ amen all right well what we want to do is talk about the fact that heaven can be a destination known it says in scripture no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him so with our eyes we've not seen into eternity we've not listened inside of eternity our minds are finite and cannot in any way shape or form fully comprehend what awaits us what God has in store for us now we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in the book of Revelation this evening 
Uh, and by the way, we're going to take a break. We're not going to be sitting here for a long period of time, but this is not our, a 45-minute study. There's no way that we can do this in 45 minutes. This, by the way, is about a, a three to a four hour lecture in seminary. So what I've done, I've skimmed off from that lecture what I think are some of the most important discoveries in the Word of God to help us understand what awaits us. But we're going to take a break uh, during the evening, get up, stretch our legs, come back. All of you that are joining us online, you can pop the popcorn and uh, whatever and uh, take a break as well. So before we get into our study, we want to remember that Revelation uh, is what is called apocalyptic literature. Now, hermeneutics is this uh, class that you take in Bible college or seminary or we read of it and it's actually the science of biblical interpretation. There are rules that we have to follow if we're going to interpret the Bible. Very important that we follow the rules. And Revelation is apocalyptic literature and what that means is that there are symbols. Now there are four books in the Bible with apocalyptic literature. Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Revelation. So three in the Old Testament, one in the New, full of uh, symbols. And these symbols mean something. Uh, so if somebody's trying to interpret Revelation literally, the beast with ten crowns or ten eyes, etc., uh, the 200 million soldiers, all right, are these two? I've heard some people say the 200 million soldiers are coming from China to invade Israel. Well, that is what is called eisegesis. We read into the text something that is not there. Exegesis, we take out of the text the original meaning. So there are symbols in this book of Revelation that we need to appropriately interpret. And those Symbols have something to do with numbers. For example, if I ask you the number seven, anybody know what the number seven means? Perfect. It's, it means perfect. It means full, complete. As do, oh, excuse me, as do, uh, do the numbers 10 and, and 12. They mean something. Uh, colors mean something. White always represents purity. Red represents blood and so on. Black is evil. So, Colors mean something. Images have unique meanings. For example, in Greek, uh, the word crown, uh, there are two Greek words for crown. And in Revelation, sometimes the word diadema appears, and that means a ruling crown, diadem, a diadem. There's power, there's authority, a diadem. The other word for crown in Revelation in Greek is stephanos. It's that victor's crown, just like if we run a race in the um, uh, Olympics long, long, long ago, a runner in the original Olympics would get a crown of ivy or a, a victor's crown. So what we want to understand is there are numbers and colors and images, even the crowns and so on, that have unique meaning, and that's going to be a part of our conversation this evening. Now, what I want to do, here's our context, here's the approach. I want us to think about heaven as a journey. We, we've got a carry-on bag here, purposefully. So what I want you and I to think of is we're going on the trip of a lifetime, let, let's say we're saving up for retirement and we're going to take that Alaskan cruise or we're going to go to Israel uh, for a Holy Land tour in celebration of retirement. Well, what we would do is we would get the literature, whether on the website or the travel guides, we would study, 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 and we would prepare for our departure. We'd go to the airport or whatever. Maybe it's a cruise to Hawaii. We'd go to the port. We would depart. And then we would arrive. And once we arrived at our destination, then there would be activities. Same thing. That's going to be our approach tonight in our study. We're going to talk very briefly about our departure from here, planet Earth. I'm going to do a very quick review of last Sunday morning's message. Very quick. It might be that somebody here this evening, whether on site or online, wasn't able to be with us. So I need to do a very quick review of that because departure from planet earth is very important then we're going to talk about uh, Jesus when he comes back 
And where actually is heaven? Because when Jesus comes back, heaven is not up there. It's not the abode of God. We're going to unpack our arrival. So our arrival, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do in this new place after Jesus comes back, our activities. So just think about a trip of a lifetime, departure, arrival, activities. And that's our context for understanding this trip of a lifetime. And we uh, certainly don't want to make the trip alone. We want others to go with us. All right, so here we go. Let's talk about some of those departure details. Remember on Sunday, I made mention of there's this doctrine of soul sleep where people think that they lie in the ground. And that comes primarily out of 1 Thessalonians 4 where we have this phrase, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So people over the years have thought, oh, I'm in the grave, I'm in the ground, and I'm gonna rise up. And not only does that appear here in in 1 Thessalonians 4, but it also appears in 1 Corinthians 15. So by the same author, Paul, he makes the statement, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, there it is, imperishable. So people have thought, oh yeah, I must be in the ground, I'm going to be raised up at the second coming of Jesus. Well, what you and I want to remember is the thief on the cross, Jesus said that today you're going to be with me in paradise. On Sunday, I said, we can't be six feet under uh, and with Jesus in paradise at the same time. He's telling the, pre, uh, the, the thief on the cross, today, you draw your last breath, you're going to be with me in paradise. Now, also, what I did not have time to make mention of on Sunday is Luke 16. And Luke 16 is where Jesus is speaking about Lazarus and the rich man. And if you just remember that story, Lazarus was a beggar and he ate crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. When Jesus was speaking about this, he said, there came a day when Lazarus died and the angels took him to the bosom of Abraham. That's what one version says. Or again into paradise. The angels took him there. But likewise, the rich man also died. And it says, in hell, where he was in torment. Chapter 16, the time came when the beggar died. The angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell, where he was in torment. We're going to unpack that one a little bit in just a little while. So a person dies here, and they literally pass from this realm into the next. And what I made mention of Sunday from Revelation 19, we want to remember that the church was given fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. So the church, meaning believers who have died before the coming of Jesus, they're with him, they're given this fine linen, bright and clean. Now, again, is it literal? No, we're in Revelation. Colors mean something. So this is the identity of the church, capital C, the bride of Christ, those who have died in the Lord and their home with the Lord. Now, we went on in Revelation and we made mention that here's heaven standing open. There's a white horse. The rider is called faithful and true. It's got to be Jesus. He judges, makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one but, uh, knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. This has to be Jesus. And here we go. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So that's the church. If we die before Jesus comes back, if we check out before he checks in, we're home with the Lord and we come back with him at the second coming as a spiritual army to vanquish evil. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will uh, rule them with an iron scepter, typo there. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has this name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So what we want to remember then is just simply to be absent from the body is to be what? Home with the Lord. 
So we're not asleep in the grave. It's not the doctrine of soul sleep. Similarly, it's not the doctrine of purgatory we made mention of very quickly. Purgatory means final purging. If that's the case, if we don't go to heaven when we die and we go to purgatory, a place where there's a final purging, then Jesus' statement on the cross, it is finished, means nothing. And what he declared in that moment was not that his life is finished. My life is over. My life is finished. That's not what it means. It's a business declaration, meaning paid in full, your sin debt and mine paid in full by his death on the cross. So we don't go to purgatory. What we want to say when we pass away is we're home with the Lord. We're home with the Lord. The thief on the cross, home with the Lord. Revelation, uh, we are home with the Lord and we're coming back. Now, this is real important. This is now all the review is done. We're going to make a segue here, and this is something that we want to try to remember, and that is this, that right now, think about a loved one who's home with the Lord right now. It might be mom, dad, grandma, grandma, it might be a child, somebody that you know who is home with the Lord. In this moment, they are enjoying what we call the intermediate state. And what that means is if, if someone comes up to me and goes, oh, Gary, your grandma, she, she loved the Lord. She led you to Jesus. Uh, she's, she's there with the Lord right now walking on streets of gold. And I go, mm, er, not yet, not yet, because streets of gold, that's Revelation 21 after the second coming of Jesus. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So right now, your loved ones and mine our home with the Lord, but it's not the fullness of heaven. It's the intermediate state. We're gonna we're gonna see that unfold in just a moment scripturally, and uh, it's, it's paradise, no doubt about it. It's paradise. They are in the abode of God. Remember, we talked about that. They've been caught up to the third heaven, the abode of God. First heaven, right here where we have rain and snow, first heaven, sun, moon, and stars, second heaven, the abode of God beyond that, the third heaven. And that's where our loved ones are right now. So the intermediate state, let's talk about this a little bit. Before Jesus comes back, right now, the intermediate state, three things about it, it's a place of togetherness. So just think about your loved ones who are there and mine and they know one another. We're going to talk about that. Their identity, they know one another. We maintain our identity. It's a place of togetherness. It's a place of awareness. They are fully cognizant, just like you and I are now. We can sense the temperature in the room. We can see color. We can hear, etc. We can speak. They are fully uh, cognizant, aware of what's going on, of what's around them, fully aware and it's a place of identity, complete identity. And you'll see that in a text. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn with me to Revelation 6. Now, what did I mention on Sunday? There's a rule in hermeneutics, context before what? Content, that's right. Context before content. What you and I want to remember is that in Revelation, we have three visions going on. There's the vision of the seven seals. Then there's the vision of the seven trumpets. And then there's the vision of the seven bowls, B-O-W-L-S, bowls. Seven seals, S-E-A-L-S, that were going to be broken. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Now, what you and I want to uh, know here is this. Revelation, the last book of the Bible. What's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. And in Genesis, there's a guy by the name of Joseph. He had a coat of many colors. Remember that? His dad loved him, gave him this coat of many colors. And then Joseph didn't have one vision, but he had two, two visions, two dreams. Remember, there was one where the sheaves of grain were what? What were they doing? They were bowing down, that's right, to Joseph, bowing down to Joseph. And then a completely different dream that he had, and the sun, moon, and stars, the planets, what were they doing? 
they were bowing down to Joseph in a second dream. So two different dreams, two different visions with the same meaning. Hey, guess what? Dad, mom, brothers, you're going to bow down to me. He, now, he didn't have a clue what that meant, but two different visions with the same meaning. Ah, that's in Genesis, first book of the Bible. God does the same thing in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation. Three different visions, all with the same what? Meaning. And if you and I study the seven seals, there's the breaking of seals one through six with great suffering, great suffering. But in the end, seal number seven, who do you think comes back? Jesus. Great suffering, but in the end, I come back. Trumpets. The trumpets are blown. Trumpets number one through six, great suffering, horrific suffering. And then trumpet number seven, who do you think comes back? Jesus. I'm back. And then the seven bowls. Bowls one through six are poured out, horrific suffering, difficult suffering. But then that seventh bowl is poured out, and who do you think's back? Jesus is back. What you and I need to see there is the uh, three different visions, same meaning. Now, here's a rule of hermeneutics. If something is repeated, it's important. God is making a point that he doesn't want anybody to miss. Case in point, the seven letters to the seven churches, they end with, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Every one of the letters ends that way. Not just one, all seven of them do. It's repeated. And so what God wants us to understand there is with each letter, come on now, don't let this go in one ear and out the other. You pay attention to it. Sermon on the Mount. Many times Jesus says, hey, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, do not kill, but I tell you. See, he says that over and again. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. In other words, you listen to what I have to say. If something's repeated, it is important. The fact that there are three, not just one, but three visions, distinctively different, all with the same meaning. There's going to be suffering, but in the end, I come back. What we have here is the theme of Revelation. And Revelation, its its whole theme is wrapped up in chapter 2, verse 10, the last sentence of verse 10. You could write that down. 2, verse 10, last sentence. And, And Jesus says, Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful to the point of death, I'll give you the crown of life. There's the whole message of Revelation. Revelation is not a difficult book to understand. Not at all. I've taught it many times, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And God wants us to be able to understand it. Otherwise, it's not of any help to us. And the whole message of Revelation, all 22 chapters, is, hey, there's going to be suffering in this world, but you be faithful. You hold on to me because in the end, what? I come back. I come back. You're going to suffer through a pandemic, but hold on. I come back. Now, where we are, all of that is context for Revelation. We are in chapter 6, and this is during the six or the seven seals. This is before the seventh seal is broken. And what we read there is, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. Now, we would call them what? It starts with an M. Martyrs. So there, there are martyrs. They've been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. So they're not going to give up. Kind of like the, uh, about a year and a half ago or so, there were Coptic Christians in North Africa. They were captured by ISIS. And 20, 21 of these men, they were kneeling along the Mediterranean Sea and there was an ISIS fighter behind each of them. And each one of these Christians were told, uh, reject Jesus recant your Christian faith and every single one of them said no and every single one of them was decapitated or had their throats slashed so they were martyrs maintaining their faith and revelation be faithful to the what point of death and I'll give you the what crown of life in that moment last breath here first breath there uh, absent from the body home with the Lord 
So martyrs. Now let's go on. They, these people, called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So this is before the second coming of Jesus. This is going on right now in heaven. Right now. So now just stop and think about your loved ones who are there as well as mine. This is before Jesus comes back right now in the intermediate state, in the intermediate state, we take those yellow highlighted phrases and this is what we discover. People are remembered for what they did on earth. These are the ones who had been slain because of their testimony. They were remembered for what they had done on earth. And I don't believe it's just people who are martyred. People, loved ones who are there now are remembered for what they did on earth. Their, their earthly sojourn wasn't forgotten, etc. How they served the Lord, etc. Uh, people are also able to express themselves. They have rational thought, emotional. They have feeling. They're communicative. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood? See, there's emotion there. There's communication. There's a rational thought. A question is being posed. That's going on right now in heaven with your loved ones in mind who are home with the Lord. Uh, they ask the Lord a question, meaning that they have an audience with him. They're in his presence, and he answers them. He answers them. Our loved ones are in the presence of the Lord. They can have conversation with him. Conversation with him. Uh, people are longing for justice. They want God to say to Jesus, today's the day, go back. There are people longing for justice. Each was given a white robe. Each was given a white robe, and that emphasizes individuality. Right now, your loved ones are known. I had a, an older sister. Her name, Mary. She lived one day and then died. My sister is home with the Lord. She has identity, and I will know her someday. My mom and dad are home with the Lord. Who greeted them? Mary. So you and I are known. Remember when Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, were on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration? Do you remember that in the uh, Gospels? And who did they see on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration? Who, who appeared to them? Moses and Elijah. Well, how did they know that they were Moses and Elijah? Did, did they have their, a copy of their yearbook? Did, did, he, did they see their pictures posted on Facebook or out there on Instagram? No, Moses and Elijah maintained their identity in the intermediate state. So you and I are going to be known in the intermediate state if we check out before Jesus checks in. If we die and we are home with the Lord before the Lord comes back, all right? So now when a believer dies, he's home with the Lord in a place of comfort. The fullness of heaven is yet to come, yet to come. Uh, at the second coming of Jesus. Remember the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. I've done a lot of weddings, and I can't imagine eating some of the fried chicken and food, cutting into the wedding cake before the bride and the bridegroom arrive. That's a big no-no. The party doesn't start until the bride and the groom are there. Similarly, the fullness of heaven, the fullness of heaven does not start. Party hardy does not begin until the bride and the groom are together. And that happens at the second coming of Jesus. It's just that it's not rocket science. It's easy to, to recall. Now, before we talk about Jesus coming back, here it is. This is huge. Cannot talk about heaven without talking about hell. When a non believer dies, Right now, today, when a non-believer dies, he is away from the Lord in a place of torment. And the fullness of hell is yet to come at the second coming of Christ. What do I mean by that? Just think, think of how logical this is. It says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, that everybody stands before God on judgment day. All of us do. 
And the longest single passage on Judgment Day is in Revelation 20. It's very easy to understand. But everybody, great and small, everybody stands before the judgment seat of God. All of these non-believers who have already experienced the torment of hell, they are called into God's presence because they, they don't know God in hell, obviously. God's not there. Jesus is not there. So every unsaved person is going to stand before God, see God, hear God, experience God. They're going to see Jesus, hear Jesus, experience Jesus, and realize it was true what? After all. It was true after all. And that could have been mine. And that will amplify their torment in, ter in eternity all the more. So what is so very important for you and I to understand is this. Hell is an eternal destruction. When people say, oh, how can something be eternally destroyed? Easy for God. A burning bush, book of Exodus, Moses standing next to a burning bush. Here's a bush, it's on fire, but it was not consumed. That's, that's nothing for God. So there can be eternal destruction, eternal suffering. And when somebody says, oh God, he's too loving to do that, he, he would never do that. You and I have got to understand is, God's ways are beyond our understanding and God is just. Jesus said more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. And he spoke of it as being eternal uh, in duration. And you and I, if we truly love somebody, we have got to tell them about hope in Jesus Christ. As I said on Sunday, how can we say we love somebody if we do not tell that somebody about heaven and hell? All right, so there's uh, the intermediate state. So now what we want to do, we're going to transition in just a moment into uh, Jesus coming back. Henry Nouwen, uh, he said... Quote, death is a part uh, of a much greater and much deeper event, the fullness of which we cannot comprehend, but of which we know that is a life-bringing event. See, we, we think of death perhaps with a wrong perspective. It's life-bringing, not life-taking. What seemed to be the end proved to be the beginning. What seemed to be a cause for fear proved to be a cause for courage. What seemed to be defeat proved to be victory. What seemed to be the basis for despair proved to be the basis for hope. And suddenly, a wall becomes a gate. And the question is, are you and I ready for that gate? So, the intermediate state. Now, what about when Jesus comes back? We're going to talk a little bit here, and then we'll take a break, all right? When Jesus returns, what you and I want to talk about is this destination. So let's think, our, our we're going on a cruise to Hawaii for retirement. So we get on the ship, there at the port, we depart. So we depart, and then we're going to arrive in Honolulu or wherever. So what we want to talk about is the destination details. That's where we're going in this next section. For example, just where is heaven? Here's a lot of confusion in the minds of people. People keep thinking heaven is up there somewhere. Well, when Jesus comes back, it's not up there. And, and this is clearly what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter 21, in verse 1 and 5, then I saw a what? New heaven and a what? New earth. <laughs> we have got to land on that, that phrase, new earth. It's huge. A new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So that word heaven is referring to the sky and the celestial. So the first heaven and the first earth, this earth passes away. It is destroyed at the second coming of Jesus. This earth on which we live is marred. It is far from perfect. It's not perfect as it was in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So this earth is destroyed, the sun, the moon, the stars, the atmosphere, the clouds, it's all destroyed, and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. 
There was no longer any sea. I'm going to unpack that phrase. That, that's huge. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making how much new? Everything. Everything is going to be new. So now just stop and think with me. Everything on planet Earth is going to burn like a twig someday. So all the great big houses and all the great big skyscrapers and every factory and every Amazon building, everything goes up in smoke at the second coming of Jesus. Uh, second Peter chapter 3, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, when least expected. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. So just think of the uh, elements of the earth. Coals, uh, magnesium, etc. The elements of the earth are going to be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It says in Matthew 24, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will what? Pass away. But my words will never pass away. Matthew 24, 35. So what you and I want to understand is what is called the concept of continuance. This is... This, to me, is so exciting. When you and I look at Genesis, here we are in Genesis, there's Revelation. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, everything is brand spanking new, created by God by order of his command. Fiat, F-I-A-T, not a car, F-I-A-T, not a car, but it means order of his command. So God spoke everything into existence. Uh, it says in Genesis, it says, um, uh, God saw everything that he made, verse 31, chapter 1, and it was how good? Very good. And then it says there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So God saw all that he made, and it was very good. That means it was without any kind of an imperfection. Chapter 1, chapter 2 of Genesis. And then chapter 3 is where sin shows up, Satan. <coughs> In Revelation, last two chapters, 21 and 22, just like the first two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21, 22, God makes everything what? New. New heavens, new earth. So he picks up where he what? Left off. He picks up where he left off. In other words, the concept, the idea of God continuing, the concept of continuance. So that's got to uh, shape our thinking about life on this new planet. And you're, you'll see how that factors into what life's going to be like there. Isaiah 65, verse 17. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. The former things the pandemic, the molestation, the unemployment, the divorce, the former things will not come to mind. The long battle with cancer, the horrific accident, they will not come to mind. I'm going to create new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 66, 22, as the new heavens and the new what? Earth, earth that I make will endure before me. You see, over and again, if it's repeated, it's, it's important. There's going to be a new earth. And that's where heaven is at the second coming of Jesus. This does not happen until Jesus splits the clouds. So right now, before a second coming, it's the intermediate state. We're home with the Lord. It's paradise. But it's not the fullness of eternal life on a new earth. That comes when he returns. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And I love that, the home of righteousness. Now, just stop and think with me. People have asked me over the years, oh, aren't you excited about streets of gold? And I go, mm, no, not at all. And they'll go, oh, so what are you looking forward to? And I go, a home of righteousness. When Jesus splits the clouds and God creates a new earth, sin will no longer exist, which means you and I cannot ever, 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 never, ever, ever, never again be, what's the T word? tempted we can't be tempted again anybody excited about that no longer an impure thought no longer 
an, un, uh, an unholy desire, no longer an unkind word, no longer feelings of jealousy and anger, no fighting, no fussing, no arguing, no war. It's going to be incredible. That's what I'm excited about, a place of absolute righteousness. And we're going to unpack that just a little bit more, okay? Revelation 21, verse 1, Then I saw that new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, what we're going to talk about are what I call landmarks, and then we're going to take a coffee break. So, think with me for a moment. If we go to St. Louis, what will we see? The, the arch. If we go to San Francisco, what might we see? The Golden Gate Bridge. If we go to New York City, what might we see? Statue of Liberty. If we go to Washington, D.C., what might we see? The Capitol Building. There are many landmarks. See, cities have landmarks. Now, as we get into the text, remember, Revelation is apocalyptic, full of images. So what we're going to see here is an image, not a literal, an image of a city called the new what? The new Jer... Jerusalem. Anybody know what Jerusalem means? The city of who? City of God. That's what it means. The city of God, Jerusalem. So when we read now in Revelation about the new Jerusalem, it's not a literal city like Jerusalem in Israel. Here we are. We're going to, in our mind, have a concept of a city, and it's where God dwells. So here we have planet Earth where God dwells and what we're going to pick up from the landmarks of the city in Revelation 21 and 22 is what life is going to be like, destination details on this new Earth after Jesus splits the clouds and comes back. So here we go. Landmarks. In Revelation 21 verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles. Verse 19, same chapter, the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Literal stones? No. But here is something that symbolically needs to be unpacked. In the Bible, when there was a city with, like Jericho with great high walls, the walls were the reputation of that city. And the higher, the thicker, the bigger the walls, the safer who? Who? the people who lived in that city. So cities wanted the reputation of incredible walls because then the people who lived in that city would feel what? Safe, safe and secure. What we want to see here is these walls are ginormous in concept. How many foundations? Twelve. What's the number of 12 mean? Complete in the book of Revelation. The number 10 and 12 means complete. So what we want to see here is not 12 literal foundations made of each a precious stone, but a complete sense of enormity, of, of great strength. The wall, let's go on talking about that wall. It had a great high wall with 12 gates. Ah, there's that number 12 again. Not 12 literal, but a complete set of gates with 12 angels. The gates were written, names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, stop and think with me. Gates in a city wall permitted people to, to what? To enter, exactly. So here are all of these entry points to new earth, eternity with God. There was a complete way to be in this new place called a new earth, a city of God, God's presence for eternity. Let's keep talking about the landmarks. The wall, the city was laid out like a square. We'll look at this carefully. As long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, as wide and high as it is long. So it's the shape of a what? A cube. That's right, a cube. And people have looked at, oh, 12,000 miles long, 12,000 miles high, 12,000 miles wide. No, it's a cube for sure. But think with me, that number 12,000. And stadia, that, that can't equate to the word miles. It, we don't know what that measurement is. 12,000 is 12 times 10. 
What's that? 12 times 10. 120 times 10. 1,200 times 10. 12,000. The number 10 and the number 12. The number 10, 10, 10, the number 12, saying complete, complete, complete. The city walls are showing to us something that is complete. Now think about this cube, and what's this describing? The city of God, the new city of God. Let's go to the Old Testament for a moment, and this is where Solomon was building the what? The temple, that's right. Remember the temple? There was the holy place. And the priest would go in there every day, the table of showbread, the, the lamp of in, uh, the, uh, incense, and the lamp, and so on. But then there was the holy of holies, and who went there? The high priest did. How often? One day a year, the day of atonement. The holy of holies. And what was in the holy of holies? The ark of the covenant. And the ark of the covenant represented who? God's presence in and among his people. God's presence right there. Now watch this. He, Solomon, partitioned off 20 cubits at the rear of the temple with cedar boards from floor to ceiling to form within the temple and the inner sanctuary the most holy place. So here's the blueprint for the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is going to be. Ready? The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 wide and 20 high. Verse 20 says, what's that the shape of? A cube. God picks up where God what? Left off. What he's telling us through the symbols, the symbols of revelation, is I'm going to be right there with you. After Jesus comes back, I am there with you. The wall. Uh, Revelation, uh, here we go. 21, the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits. Now, there's a number that we know, a cubit, the length of the middle finger to the elbow, 144 cubits thick. Literally, or what's, what equals 144? Do the math. Ah, 12 times 12. There's that 12 stuff again. See, a complete sense, a complete sense of the thickness of that wall. And what you and I want to see is that there would be great safety. Let's just talk about the great, uh, gates for a moment. It had a great high wall, 12 gates, 12 angels on the gates. Gates were, uh, on them were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. Doesn't mean literal. The gates, verse 25 of chapter 21, they're never going to be shut. There will be no what? Night there. Why did cities shut their gates at night? To protect the people in the uh, city. That's right, because bad things happen in the dark. As the sun is going down, the city watchmen would close those gates and bar them so that the people were safe inside of that city. When Jesus splits the clouds, a new earth is uh, created, we're going to be absolutely safe. That's what this is teaching on this new earth. Nothing of which to be afraid. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. Uh, this great st uh, street of the city was of gold, purest transparent glass. Stop and think with me. A pearl is made in a what? In an oyster. So some kind of an irritant gets into that oyster like a grain of sand, and then the oyster secretes oil so that it starts coating that grain of sand, coats, 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 and then divers, they get that oyster, they open it up, and here's this beautiful pearl made from an irritant. Something got in that caused it to suffer, and something of great value was created. The gates of this new Jerusalem are not literal pearls. I've seen pictures of gates uh, that look like a giant pearl that's not what it is again it's an image that is symbolic that needs to be interpreted how do you and I enter into this new world how do we enter into this eternity through someone's suffering and whose suffering was that the suffering of Jesus he is the gate through which we enter heaven it was his suffering on a cross that gave to us this priceless gift of eternal life. And then, 
we, what's that message from Revelation? Be faithful until the what? Point of death. Be faithful. You're going to suffer. Life is not a primrose path. Life is not free of difficulty. You be faithful. You be faithful. You be faithful. You hold on to Jesus through all of that suffering because in the end, Jesus, what? Comes back. So through suffering, we enter into incredible life that is beyond our comprehension. That's the gate made of a single pearl. His suffering, that of Jesus, is how we get in. So, why so many landmarks that describe complete security? Emmanuel, on this new earth, God is with us. God is with us. Eternal life on the new earth, think of it as up close and personal. Chapter 21, God's dwelling. The word dwelling appears there, and that word dwelling means tent in Greek. I don't know if you've ever gone camping, and I'm not talking about that 36 or 40 foot McMansion on wheels. I'm talking about a pup tent. Uh, a group of guys at the creek, we go mountain climbing. We've climbed dozens of the 14ers out in Colorado, and I'm here to tell you we have little, little uh, tents, and it's, it's pretty close quarters. That's what this word is. So uh, I, and I don't know if you've ever had anybody wipe a tear from your eye. If anybody, you've allowed anyone to touch your face, that's pretty intimate. And what we want to understand here, eternal life on planet Earth is going to be up close and personal with Jesus in a huge way. He's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, we're going to see his face, chapter 22, verse 4 of Revelation. Not hidden from us, we're going to see him. 21 verse 22 God and the lamb are its temple we're not going to have church buildings no need for them why because God and Jesus the lamb are moving among us and remember God is ubiquitous he's omnipresent everywhere at the what same time so just as uh, Larry is enjoying the presence of Jesus Guess what? I'm going to be enjoying the presence of Jesus. Same time, because Jesus can be everywhere at the same time. The God and the Lamb are its temple. No longer will there be any curse. Revelation 22, verse 3. This is the curse of death. Back in Genesis 3, God said to Adam and Eve, From dust you came, and to dust you will return. The curse of death. No longer will there be any curse, meaning nobody's going to die. Nobody gets ill. Nobody gets sick. Nobody gets injured. You and I are going to be able to climb mountains and not uh, run out of breath. We're not going to get winded. We're, we're, we're going to be able to enjoy life everlasting because there's no curse of death. Now get this, and because there's no curse of death, there's no longer any sea. When John wrote that in verse 1, chapter 21, remember, he's writing from where? Context. John, the revelator, the disciple of John, was writing from where? Anybody remember? From Patmos, the island of Patmos, a prison island. So he's about 55, 60 miles out in the Aegean Sea away from the homeland, the mainland. He's writing this letter and he says, oh boy, when Jesus comes back, no longer any sea. He's not talking about water. What does that water do? That water separates him from his loved ones. You and I on this new earth will never, ever, ever, never, ever say goodbye to somebody we love. We will never be separated again. Never. That's the destination. Those are some of the details that are so apparent in the Word of God, and yet many of us aren't aware of that. You know, uh, somebody asked me once, how long is eternity, Gary? And I thought, well, how do I use, the, how do I describe the word eternity without using words of time? It's beyond, I believe, our conception. So I'm gonna share this description of eternity, and we're gonna take a break. Imagine a mountain made of solid granite. A thousand miles high and a thousand miles across at its base. A thousand miles. And once every one million years, one million years, a bird comes and lands on that 1,000 mile high mountain of granite, and he, that bird, is allowed to peck for only 10 seconds at that granite mountain, a thousand miles high, once every one million years. 
and as soon as that mountain is completely eroded. Thousand miles high, thousand miles across, solid granite, one million years, 10 seconds of pecking. Once that mountain is completely eroded and gone, that to eternity is but one day. We cannot comprehend how long eternity is with one another and with Jesus on this new earth, a home of righteousness. So let's take uh, a moment. Uh, we'll take a break, and uh, let's uh, come back in. Uh, it's 7.20. Let's come back at 7.30, okay? And uh, we'll wrap up. Mm-hmm. 
there on this topic and people came up afterwards and said man so much of this I've never heard before can I have a photocopy of your notes so what I did instead I just put it into a book form now this book is interesting in that it's really two books in one one two and when, when I was putting this together I was doing a Bible study of Ecclesiastes uh, Solomon wrote that in the end of his life. It's a, uh, it's a journal. It's nothing more than a journal, and he's reflecting in the final fourth quarter of life, just like in four quarters in a football game, and he's realizing he's losing. He's made some horrible decisions. So this first, first part of the book, part one, is help for today, what the Bible says about retirement. And it says nothing about retirement. When you and I are in the fourth quarter of life, I, there are four plays that you and I do not want to blow. And I describe those in the book right out of Ecclesiastes with discussion questions from Ecclesiastes. Then you turn it this way, help for today becomes hope for tomorrow. And hope for tomorrow is what does the Bible say about heaven? Here we're getting... Uh, kind of like the, the icing on the cake. And so all of the in-depth stuff is here in the book. And right now on the E2 website, e2elders.org, we're in our 12 days of Christmas uh, sale. Everything is a true BOGO, buy one, get one. So this book that costs $12 is really just $6. So if you know of somebody that maybe is approaching this season of life, the fourth quarter, uh, if you know of somebody who really is confused about heaven, it, even the plan of salvation is described in this book, step by step. I talk about how does one come to Christ. It's described in this book. So if you know somebody who would be benefited, buy one, get one. And uh, then what I'm talking about this evening is also video lessons. The full length is on this jump drive. And you can use this in an in in-home Bible study. There are discussion questions at the end of every video. And again, it's buy one, get one. So this is $25. You get not one, but two. And these are video. Uh, and then you've heard so much about Revelation. The last time I taught Revelation, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we filmed it in different settings. So for example, the seven letters to the seven churches, I'm out by the mailbox at Indian Creek Christian Church and the videography team is videotaping. But on this jump drive, there are 22 chapters of Revelation. Every video ends with discussion questions. There are churches across the country using this for study groups, Bible studies, uh, Sunday school, etc. And not only is it available here, but we have our final DVDs. That were, these are only $10. Buy one, get one. Uh, again, $25. It's about $1.10 per lesson. Uh, not making a lot of money doing this. The, we, I want people to have an understanding of what this book says about heaven and revelation is an easy book to understand it is not confusing so just see us afterwards and all of you who are online feel free go to our website it's it really is a bogo through the 12th of december and uh, we have these available also in the lobby today all right so now we're going to get back into our study what I want to talk just a little bit about then, let's put this thinking cap on, the doctrine of immutability. If something is immutable, it cannot what? Anyone? Can't change. That's right. So you and I got to understand something. God does not change. God is forever the same. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. Hence, when we add the 
fact that God doesn't change to his desire to pick up at the end where he left off at the beginning. Just a couple of things here. God's going to be our provider. He's going to provide for us throughout all of eternity. That river of life, that tree of life, is it literal? It's symbolic. He is going to care for us. Just like in the Garden of Eden, what did God say to Adam and Eve? Here, you can eat all of this. You can eat from any tree except one. Just keep your cotton-picking hands off from one tree. They had everything, and who provided it? God did. So God is immutable. God's going to be our protector on this new earth, a home of righteousness. Nothing impure will ever enter into it. He's our protector, and he's our peacemaker. I love this about Revelation 22, verse 2. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. And that word nations in Greek is the word ethnos. So the leaves are for the healing of the different ethnic groups, people of different ethnicities. Now, a literal tree, literal leaves, etc. No, what we see here are uh, the, the leaves of the tree are for the healing. And that word healing is a Greek word, therapia, that sounds like therapy. So there's not going to be any conflict of any kind whatsoever among all the people uh, on this new earth, followers of Jesus. So, it's going to be an incredible place. Now, just what are we going to do with these new and improved bodies? Can you imagine an existence for eternity without one diet? No dieting. Uh, it's going to be a pretty impressive place. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, in, in this longest passage on the resurrected body. See, resurrection, the longest passage is 1 Corinthians 15, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The longest single passage on resurrection is 15 of 1 Corinthians. Why is that? Because Paul, the apostle, was dealing with Gnostics. They were people who thought they had a monopoly on knowledge, and they were perverting their teaching about resurrection. They were going, who would want a new body when they're resurrected? So Paul is setting them straight. Now, let's turn in our Bibles over to 1 Corinthians 15. There's something there that you and I need to see about understanding what our new bodies are going to be like. And this is pretty cool. So, in verse 20, Paul says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits of those who have died, fallen asleep, a euphemism for died. Remember, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, miraculously by Jesus, Lazarus would die again. Lazarus would die again. At the crucifixion of Jesus, do you remember how we read that some of the graves of holy people were opened and they came to life? They did come to life, but they would what? Die again. Jesus is the first to die and to be raised from the dead, never to die again. Never to die again. He's the first fruits. Now, the offering of first fruits. In the Old Testament, there was that offering of first fruits that if, if you and I were farmers and we had a barley field, we would go out, and when the barley is ripe and ready for harvest, we would harvest a certain percentage of it. Do you remember how much we would harvest? A tenth, that's right, a tenth of that field. And what would we do with that tenth of the barley crop? We would take it and give it to the priest at the temple or the tabernacle. And as we did so, that was the offering of first fruits, declaring that what we just took out of the field, the same thing is going to come out of the field. We took barley out of the field, we're going to get barley out of the field. So when we think about Jesus being the first fruits, he was raised from the dead, the first to be raised from the dead, never to die again. We are going to be raised from the dead, never to die again, and we are going to be raised just like him and more. Now watch this. When we read in verse 23, it says, uh, but each his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, see, at his second coming, when he comes, those who belong to him. So we're going to be raised bodily. In other words, we're going to be given a body at his second coming, not in the intermediate state where grandma is right now, or we will be someday if, if we die before Jesus comes back. 
When he comes back, that's when that new body happens, and we can even see that. Notice, um, uh, well, we're going to get to that. Let me just show you the verse. See, in verse 51 through 57, it's going to happen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We, we will all be changed in a flash, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, we will be changed. So at the second coming of Jesus, we're going to be given this new body. We don't need the new body until we get a new what? A new earth on which to live. So at the trumpet, remember, Jesus is going to come back with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. So at the blowing of that trumpet, and remember in the Old Testament, when the priest blew the trumpet, that was to gather the together. Similarly, the trumpet call of God, God's people are going to be gathered together at the second coming of Jesus. Now, let's go back here. I want us to see something in verse 36. Notice it says, What you sow does not come to life until it dies. Until it dies. So if we have a kernel of corn and we put that kernel of corn into the ground and uh, it germinates, that seed dies. What's going to come from that kernel of corn, anybody? A stalk of wheat? No. A stalk of what? Of corn. It's going to be the same thing, yet so much more. That little tiny kernel is going to die, and we're going to get uh, a plant growing here. It's got to be knee-high by when? By the 4th of July. Knee-high by the 4th, and it's going to grow, 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 and on it is going to be this ear, and on this ear, is there going to be one kernel of corn? No. <laughs> there are going to be hundreds of kernels of corn. It's the same thing, yet so much more. You know what? You and I, when we get our new body, we're going to be the same, but yet so much what? So much more. It's going to be beyond our comprehension. And that's why, just as this which goes into the ground and dies, and it's the same thing, you and I are going to be identifiable. We're still going to be Gary Johnson. Leah Johnson. We're still going to be the same person that we, our identity remains. It's going to be incredible. Tony Johnson. So this is what you and I have to look for. A new and improved body. This is, you can't have Tide soap that's new and improved. That's an oxymoron. When it comes to the new body, this is really accurate. It's going to be new and it is going to be improved. It is going to be improved. So, and it's going to happen instantaneously. By the way, some years ago, General Electric measured the blinking, the twinkling of an eye, four one hundredths of a second. That's how quickly we're going to get this new and improved body in the twinkling of an eye, four one hundredths of a second. Now, these new bodies, what are we going to do on this new earth? Does, does the word tell us? Oh, yeah. We can know what we're going to do. We're going to be busy worshiping. We know that. Revelation 21, we will worship then. We're going to be worshiping God. Even now, right now, those who are home with the Lord, the saved, in the intermediate state, what are they doing? They're worshiping. You know, when when somebody said, I alluded to this uh, last Sunday in one of the services, I think. Somebody came up to me often I, I hear this so often and they all say oh mom saw me graduate I just so miss my mom and whatnot and and I understand the pain of grief been there done that but then I can speak truth in love gently in love and say your mom didn't see you graduate your mom is infatuated right now with Jesus it's all eyes on Jesus And there's a misinterpretation of a verse in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And that verse says, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And that's where people stop and go, Oh, there are witnesses. Uh, They're right there in chapter 11. Moses, Joseph, David, they're, they're there. And they're all watching us. Grandma's watching me right now. She's on a cloud. She's a witness. She's watching me. That's what witness means. There are a great cloud of witnesses. And I'll say, there are moments when I don't want grandma watching me. Let me tell you. And you and I have got to understand, there's nothing in Scripture that says you and I have the ability, if we are home with the Lord, to look into this life. And I'm here to tell you, we're not interested. 
It's all eyes on Jesus in that moment. We are captivated in the intermediate state. So uh, people are worshiping the Lord. What else are we going to be doing? We're going to be busy working, and that shouldn't cause us uh, uh, to moan and groan. Stop and think with me. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, did God give them work to do? Oh, yeah, name the animals. Oh, yeah, take care of the garden. And it was, it was not hard. It didn't become hard until Adam did what? Adam sinned. That's exactly correct. In chapter 3, after he sinned, God says, by the sweat of your brow. And God talked about weeds and tares. None of that was back here in chapter 1 and 2. And so God picks up where he left off, and in Revelation 21, 22, we will be able to serve God and love every minute of it because we're not going to sweat. We're not going to run out of breath. We're not going to pull a muscle. We're not going to uh, twist an ankle. We're not going to get blisters. It's going to be pure pleasure serving our God. Revelation 22, verse 3. His servants will, not maybe, not perhaps, will serve him. And we'll never get tired of serving Jesus. Never, ever, ever, never. Genesis 2, they were caretakers of the new earth. Revelation 21, the city gates never shut. Not only do they never shut because there is no night there, there's nothing of which to be protected from, there's no evil, there's no thievery, there's no attack, but as well, do you remember in the Bible, business was transacted where? At the city gate. So when we have this image that the gates are never shut, heaven on this new earth, it's going to be a busy place, incredibly busy. Isaac Asimov, who passed away uh, some years ago, he was an atheist, very uh, outspoken about his lack of belief in God, and he made a, a statement once uh, where he said, I don't fear hell. He said, I would fear the boredom of heaven. And I'm here to tell you, there will be nothing boring whatsoever about eternity with our God. Nothing at all. Busy worshiping, busy working. Uh, how about reigning? Busy reigning. Not over one another, because if I'm reigning over you, that would cause perhaps some jealousy, some tension, some difficulty. So what would it be that we are reigning over? It says in 22, verse 5 of Revelation, we will reign forever and ever. So what does that mean? Reigning, ruling over what? Well, in Genesis 1, verse 26, we have been made in the image of God, and it says in verse 26 and 27, uh, and God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over all creatures that move along the ground. So we're going to rule, we're going to reign over the new what? The new earth concept of continuance concept of continuance Matthew 25 well done my good and faithful what servant I will put you in charge of many things so there's going to be a sense of responsibility that we have in ruling over this new earth this new creation now we can speculate the Bible doesn't speak about things but let's with this concept of continuance thinking God picks up in the end where he left off at the beginning question will we eat and drink in eternity on the new earth what do you think yes or no I think so did Adam and Eve eat and drink sure they did Adam and Eve were eating and drinking in the garden of Eden God says eat whatever plant you want to eat eat from any tree you want except just one so picking up where we left off yeah I think that we're going to eat and drink in the new earth will there be animals on the new earth what do you think yes or no sure there will be were there animals uh, on the new earth absolutely those animals reflected the great creative power of our creator that was long before sin was ever committed God spoke them into existence. I believe they're going to be spectacular animals on this new earth, and God will speak them into existence. Will we enjoy the out of doors? I believe so, absolutely. Because, again, stop and think with me. Adam, it says in chapter 2 of Genesis, was put into the garden, and it says that twice. If it's repeated, 
It's important. God took man that he had made and put him in the garden, in the garden, to work it. So Adam was made out in the wild. Where was Eve made? In the garden. So a garden is a place of beauty, a place of serenity, a place of safety, a place of peace. And that's where Eve was made. Where was Adam made? Out in the wild. Now, what you and I would want to take from that is the possibility that that really speaks to our creation order. You know, typically, men enjoy being outside. We want to go fishing or hunting or uh, golfing or whatever the case. We want to be outside. We like the out of doors, backpacking, whatever, running. We don't want to be behind a desk or standing next to a machine all day long, all night long. Similarly, ladies, you like to be creative. Uh, we don't put the doilies out. We don't decorate the walls. Ladies make things beautiful. So I believe that there's a good chance on this new earth. Uh, and remember, John 14, verse 1, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I go there now to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms, uh, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. So will we have something in which to live? Uh, it, it would appear to be something, somehow. I don't know if our new bodies are going to require that or not, but the point is, will we enjoy this new earth? Absolutely we're going to enjoy this new earth. We're going to enjoy doing what we do. For example, I believe that there's going to be plants growing uh, and it may be that we're growing corn and we're boy growing wheat and whatnot. And uh, I was talking to a farmer a few years ago, and, and he, when he heard this teaching, he just started crying. And when he came up to ask some questions, and I said, what's going on? And he said, I just buried my dad three weeks ago. My dad died on the farm where he was born. My dad never moved away. My dad farmed that farm, that ground, after his dad did and his grandpa did. And my dad taught us how to care for the soil. And he said, I know what my dad's going to do on a new earth now. And we, we get to do what we so love and enjoy doing and uh, never grow tired of it. Um, longing for the return of Christ. This is so important. In 2 Timothy, context before what? Content. Who wrote 2 Timothy? What was his name? Paul, where was he? In prison, in Rome. When he's writing 2 Timothy, he's on death row. This is his last will and testament. And in it, Paul writes towards the end, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought, and when he says time of departure, he's not referring to being released on parole. He's talking about his execution. And he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, will award to me and to all, all who long for his appearing. It's so important that we long for the return of Jesus. I uh, remember Ryan, your pastor, explaining to you the term Maranatha in his sermon two weeks ago. What you and I want to remember is it is appropriate for us to pray for the return of Jesus. There are many times if I'm listening to the news, reading the paper on my phone, whatever, and I read of another atrocity, when I read of another uh, hardship, a crisis, when I hear of somebody that I know going through a great horrific moment in life, many times I'll just stop and pray, Lord Jesus, please come quickly. Bring this all to an end. Come quickly. And you and I need to have this longing within us. So no eye has seen no ear has heard, no mind has conceived 
what God has prepared for those who love him. I believe with all of my heart we can know about the destination that God has prepared for us. And that brings to us incredible hope. And God's people say, amen. Blessings to you. Thank you uh, for your time and your hunger to be people of the word. Blessings.